Welcome to a special edition of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, FFRF Co-President. I'm Rebecca Markert, FFRF's Legal Director, and I'm happy to be here in place of Dan Barker, FFRF's other co-president. Dan's on the road doing some debates around the country this week. And I'm Andrew Seidel, the Director of Strategic Response, and like Rebecca, I'm also a constitutional attorney here at FFRF. And this is part two of our recap of FFRF's 40th Annual Convention last month, and it was a lot of fun despite having a lot of serious reality checks with major speakers. And on uh, Ask an Atheist uh, last yeah, week, we on, showed the first part. Yeah, we did. And we actually showed some excerpts of speakers and awardees at FFRF's conference right here in Madison. That was September 15th and 16th. Um, we saw expert excerpts of speeches from Steven Pinker, FFRF's honorary president, one of the highlights, Michelle Goldberg, who's the New York Times' newest op-ed columnist, and Mariam Namazi, who received the Henry H. Zumach Freedom from Fundamentalist Religion Award. This week we've got more speech highlights ready for you, plus a very special photographic presentation. And um, Rebecca, after we have some video highlights, we're going to ask you some questions, um, a summary of the legal report that you gave at the convention. And there'll be a chance for people to uh, ask questions about that as well. And so now let's begin today's recap with Katha Pollitt, who's the nation's legendary writer of the bi-weekly bi column subject to debate, a poet and author, and she received FFRF's new Forward Award this year, and in her speech she pointed out the absurdity of having to fight for reproductive rights still in 2017. So here we are in 2017 fighting for birth control with an administration that has stocked government agencies with anti-choice fanatics who see contraception as the enemy and funding it as a con. Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price claims, get this, not one woman has struggled to afford birth control. Uh, FDA head Scott Gottlieb opposed the birth control provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Title 10 had, Title 10 is the government program that funds family planning for low-income people. Um, so the head of Title 10 is now a woman named Teresa Manning, who once said that contraception doesn't work. Uh, Katie Tolento. <laughs> Health policy aide to the White House Domestic Policy Council claims contraception leads to infertility and miscarriages. Charmaine Yost, who is the former head of Americans for Life and is now an assistant HHS secretary, she thinks the IUD and emergen emer sorry, emergency contraception are abortifacients. Um, and the latest, as Trump promised early in May, the administration is moving to roll back the ACA birth control provision by allowing any employer to refuse on religious or moral grounds to cover birth control. And I think this is very interesting because here's where you see that things that start out as really little, like, okay, the little sisters of the poor, these nuns, how many people work for them that need birth control anyway? Before you know it, it's everybody. Before you know it, all you have to do is say, oh, I don't like birth control. I think it's immoral. And you don't have to, and you get a, a, a uh, the ability to deny it to your to your workforce. Um, so these things that start out as little religious exceptions often balloon into much larger um, things. Now, you can find the rest of the audio for Katha Pollitt's speech and videos for almost all the other speakers from uh, the conference online at ffrf.org slash convention 2017. It's right up there on the screen, ffrf.org slash convention 2017. Now, let's take a look at the free thinkers of the year from this year's convention. And that's always my favorite part. Our county sheriff, as he mentioned, told one of the uh, local newspapers that allowing the crosses to be displayed in this manner was his way of showing his support for his deputies. Those Christian crosses that were being used back then are still being sold in a small print shop in our town. And our lawsuit actually led to the boosting of sales of those crosses. And the crosses are currently displayed on many private vehicles in Alpine. But of course, we weren't trying to stop people from placing crosses on their personal vehicles. During that time they were displaying crosses, there was some online debate on the Sheriff's Department's Facebook page. And there was one particular post that was very popular. It had thousands of likes, and it was highly shared. And this particular Facebook post stated, Dodson wanted God's protection over his deputies, and the thin blue line on the crosses stands for law enforcement. So it was a belief among some Christians that just the mere presence of a cross could help protect law enforcement officers. 
Well, as an atheist and as a U.S. Border Patrol agent, I can think of real ways for increasing the safety of our police officers. Better training and better equipment would be much more effective than relying on a cross for protection. There's approximately one billion of us atheists in the world. There are seven billion people in the world. How does one seventh convince the six sevenths that they are wrong? Mass marketing. Okay. Okay. Finally, after five long years, we did it. Full disclosure, this image may appear taller than it actually is. <laughs> but I'm proud to be a part of such an important fight for the separation of state and church. After the case was moved back to the lower court, the school realized that they were going to lose. They agreed to move the monument and pay $164,000 in legal fees. So those were our free thinkers of the year. This is an award that's reserved for plaintiffs, usually in our state church cases, who have won lawsuits. This year, we bestowed those, this award on four individuals, all who are members of FFRF. Um, they were all important local plaintiffs in our successful lawsuits. Um, you saw Jesse Castillo, one of our co-plaintiffs. Um, Kevin Price could not attend in person, um, but Jesse was there. Um, and he and Kevin were both plaintiffs in FFRF's lawsuit against Brewster County, Texas, where they had cross decals on sheriff vehicles. We also heard from Jerry Bloom, who sued with FFRF successfully to stop censorship of a free, sh free thought viewpoint by the town of Shelton, Connecticut. And we also heard from Marie Schaub, who is the essential local plaintiff in FFRF's five-year lawsuit to remove a Ten Commandments monument at her daughter's high school. And we're happy to report that this Bible monument was removed earlier this year. Other honorees at FFRF's convention include Cara Santa Maria, and she was named Free Thought Heroine. And Cara, of course, is a science educator, writer, podcaster, very vivacious. She talked about the friction that can occur in families between freethinkers and the religious. How many of you out there have parents who are or were religious before they passed? Yeah, quite a few of you. And so you probably know the experience that I'm talking about, where even if there's mutual respect, and even if you care dearly about each other, and you kind of try to know where the other one's coming from, even in the best of scenarios, there's still a bit of kind of a sorrow between you, a guilt maybe. You feel bad for the other person. You know, they feel sorry for you because you're gonna go to hell and that's terrible in their mind. And you feel bad for them because their worldview is so incredibly narrow and there are so many opportunities that they may never be able to experience or never had the chance to experience maintaining that narrow focus. Some of my favorite speakers at our convention are always the student activists. And Kelly Helton was another honoree at this year's convention. She impressed everyone. She's only 13, but I think it's pretty clear that she's going to change the world. She stressed the importance of letting people know who you really are. If we're going to change the world around us, we must first let the people around us know who we are. If I can stand up here and shout, I am an atheist, then perhaps you could come out of the closet so people realize they actually know an atheist. If everyone did this one simple thing, then maybe the next time I get out on stage and shout, I am an atheist, no one will care. And how cool will that be? And we got a great report from the world-renowned sculptor Zenas Frudakis, whom FFRF worked with in erecting a statue honoring Clarence Darrow in Dayton, Tennessee, home of the Scopes trial, and Zenas described an experience in Dayton that galvanized his resolve to create the statue. When I left, I got in the car to go, and after I scouted out this site, and I saw another group of students come and stand in front of the uh, William James Bryan sculpture. And I saw them stand there for a little while, then they started to leave, so I jumped out of the car and I ran across the court, the yard there, the county courthouse, and I said, wait, wait, you've only heard half the story. <laughs> There's going to be another sculpture here of, of Clarence Darrow. And the teacher said, she, they were from Atlanta, it was a high school class, she said, tell us about him. So I talked about Clarence Darrow. And then as they left, I thought, 
I can't spend the rest of my life sitting in a car in the parking lot, <laughs> uh, jumping out, scaring kids, uh, telling them about their, but if I had a sculpture here, if we could get it here, then um, it, it can do the talking for us. And it can tell people that, yes, there is Clarence Darrow, and there was the, uh, this, this idea of evolution, and, and get people talking. That was a great presentation Zenos gave. Now, we didn't have permission to record comedian Paula Poundstone, who is an out atheist, but she was great, very entertaining to a room full of more than 700 atheists for 90 minutes. We did, however, get to record another funny comedian, actress and atheist Julia Sweeney, our final speaker. And I actually had the pleasure of sitting with Julia at dinner and love what a genuine person she is. She's not putting on a show, she's the same on and off stage. And she actually surveyed the blockbuster Christian movies of the last year so that the rest of us wouldn't have to, and it was pretty eye-opening. Okay, then I watched The Case for Christ, the Lee Strobel story. So I read that book. When I was actually going through my personal faith journey, I read Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, which sold a zillion copies, where he's a Chicago reporter who's trying to prove God doesn't exist, but realize God does exist. <laughs> and then he wrote a book, and it sold millions of copies. And now there's this movie, and it didn't do as well. It, it cost $3 million. It only made $17 million at the box office. Um, and he's got great 80s kind of longish hair, the guy who plays Lee Strobel, and he's a rising star at the Chicago Tribune, and then his daughter um, chokes on something at a restaurant, and the woman who knows how to do the Heimlich remover at a restaurant, which is a miracle that someone would know how to do the Heimlich remover at a, maneuver at a restaurant, and saves his daughter's life, then his wife becomes a Christian because of that. <laughs> Um, because then the woman who saves the girl's life, he says, thank you. And she goes, you know, Jesus sent me here. I was going to Applebee's. But I came here and saved your daughter because Jesus knew I had to do the Heimlich maneuver. So before, uh, we do also have a treat. We have a photographic um, musical slideshow that we're going to show you that's um, memories of the convention. But before we get to that, um, we have another treat, which is, Rebecca, you're going to do a recap of the legal report that you gave at the convention, which was very impressive. Sure, sure. So I have some statistics to share um, from this last year. Um, we were able to manage 13 lawsuits in this past year, um, and we won five of those cases. Um, three are complete and closed, but two are pending appeal by the, the governments that lost. Um, we also filed four new cases. Um, and we also filed four amicus briefs, including two that were before the U.S. Supreme Court. And one of those was uh, the Muslim ban. Yes, we filed a amicus brief in support of the respondents in the Muslim ban or the travel ban case that's um, pending before the U.S. Supreme Court, arguing that it was a violation, the executive order that um, prohibited travel from six Muslim majority countries violates the Establishment Clause and then also violates the um, uh, citizenship test, um, no uh, religious test for office, um, that it creates a religious test for citizenship, which we believe violates the Constitution as well. And what about the number of complaints that came in and the number of letters? Sure. So we also reported um, that for 2017 so far, through August 31st, we've received about 2,800 um, complaints on state church issues. Um, some of those are duplicates, so when we take those out, it's about 2,400. So um, we're on course to be at about, what, 5,000? Right, right. right. So year. for last year, in 2016, we got um, about 40 4,500 um, state church contacts. So we're on course to, to meet that. Um, we did, since the last convention, send over 1,000 letters. Um, and for 2017 so far, we've sent 783. So we're well on course to, to beat that from last yes, year as so well. These are official complaint letters. Right. These are <coughs> complaints that were actionable um, that our attorneys saw as violations that we could remedy. And we don't include in that count the open records requests and follow-ups. So that's a lot more work. Yes, yes. 
and Rebecca and I are happy to take some legal questions if you have them after the, the rest of this part of the show. We'd be happy to answer any kind of legal questions about FFRF since we're both here. Absolutely. But before we get to that, how many victories? So since um, our convention in Pittsburgh last year, we had 204 victories. Um, and then so far in 2017, we've had 122. Um, yeah. And these are non-litigation victories. And a lot of, they're very, very important victories. And I think that's important to stress, too. We, this is what we do without having to go to court, without spending all this time and resources. We're just able to solve the problem right there. It's, it's a pretty big deal. It is. Well, so um, now we have a little bit of a, a fun interlude. Um, our video engineer, Bruce, whom you never get to see, Bruce Johnson, has taken our convention photographs and put them to music. And the song we're going to hear, I think it's the first song, is Die Gedanken sind frei. And this is sung by Dan Barker, and in this case, recorded with Kristen Lems. And Dan opens every convention with this song. It's a free thought song from the 15th century and was sung in the resistance, and it means, my thoughts are free. Die Gedanken sind frei, my thoughts freely flower. Die Gedanken sind frei, my thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them, no hunter can trap them, no person can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei, no person can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to duke or dictator. No person can deny, die Gedanken sind frei. No person can deny, die Gedanken sind frei. Foundations will crumble and structures will tumble and free people shall cry Die Gedanken sind frei and free people shall cry Die Gedanken sind frei So that was just the first day of the convention and now we're going to have some more photos from day two accompanied by one of Roy Zimmerman's irreverent songs. Uh, Roy Zimmerman is a satiric songwriter who also entertained us at the convention. Uh, we weren't able to videotape his performance, but we can at least share one of his songs with you now. Back when the pilgrims landed on these rocks, they thanked the Lord and they rang out their socks. They were escaping those religious tyrannies. So they said, geez, let us worship as we please. They knew the strictures of their scriptures would never fail them. And so they started lighting fires on the pyres in Salem. Freedom to oppress in the name of righteousness. Religious freedom to scratch where it itches. Religious freedom to burn our own witches. Y'all know the story of the first Thanksgiving. Historical origins of Martha Stewart living. They feasted with the Wampanoag on that shore. And then wiped out the Pequot in the Pequot War. They knew God sent them to this Eden among the heathen. Say convert to our dear Lord or you won't be breathing Freedom to oppress 
In the name of righteousness, religious freedom to scratch where it itches, religious freedom to burn our own witches. Then all the colonies said, what the hell? We don't need a king, let's ring the liberty bell. All men are equal, no one's lesser or greater. And we're endowed with certain rights by our creator. And that was sweet, but what made liberty even sweeter was they could still own slaves according to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 2 Kings and 1 Peter. So we the people formed a nation and the Bill of Rights ensured. I'm free to practice my religion and you're free to practice mine. Ain't that divine? Slavery opened up a national wound. Much blood was spilled before the Union reunion. They saved the nation in that civil war. Our fathers brought forth more than seven years before. But some were certain they could hear the Almighty saying, don't mix the races, segregate and start KKK. Freedom, to, freedom oppress. to oppress in the name of righteousness. In the name of righteousness, freedom to persecute in a biblical pursuit. Religious freedom to burn. But separate is not equal, the Supreme Court found. And they struck all the segregation laws down. They found that marriage is a basic civil right. The law can't break into your bedroom late at night. Still, some say we will not heed on elected judges. We know we're righteous and our bigotry never budges. Freedom to oppress in the name of righteousness. Religious freedom to scratch where it itches. Religious freedom to burn our own witches. Religious freedom to scratch where it itches. Religious freedom to burn, 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 burn our own witches. So we're opening it up to questions now. Please, please feel free to ask them right there in the chat and we'll get to them. Our first question is from Rick and he asked it via email and he said, if I read about a legal violation online but I don't live in the area, can I report it to FFRF? And yes. <laughs> yep, you can certainly report it and we'll take a look um, into it. Um, oftentimes we do have members that are in the area that we can contact and, and get verification on a lot of these um, state church violations, but you certainly should do that. Yeah, once something's public and reported in the papers, then we do want to know about it. But mostly people call us or contact us. It's not in the public eye, and they ask us to act on these violations on their behalf. That's the great preponderance. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know the percentage, but it seems like it's about 99% of the people are there. And we've actually, one thing that people don't realize, too, is we've had government officials contact us before and say, hey, our city council or whatever is getting ready to do this and we need political cover. Can you write a letter? <laughs> and, and that reminds me, we do always keep <clears throat> the names of complainants confidential, but we do like, when you fill out our form, we do like you to give your name and contact information because then we can verify things with you if we have further questions. And, and update you when we win. Right. And once in a while, somebody wants to have their name in the complaint letter. They're really out. <laughs> right. Uh, so the next question is from Tessa, and she asks, uh, can you tell us more about FFRF's legal brief for the Muslim ban case? It doesn't seem like a state church issue. Sure, a church I can talk a little issue. bit about that. So um, I stumbled over my words a little bit earlier, but um, one thing that we wanted to stress in the brief was that it did violate the separation between state and church. Um, Trump's first executive order was pretty explicit in what he wanted to do. He wanted to um, keep Muslims out, um, but allow Christians in. He was even quoted um, on TV at the, the Christian Broadcast Network that um, 
you know, it was really easy for Muslims to get into this country, but not for Christians, and he really wanted to help them. Help um, Christians. Help Christians. And so what the order really did was um, create a preference for Christianity in our immigration policies and laws, um, and then disfavor Muslims. Um, and that is a violation of the Establishment Clause um, to favor one religion over another um, is a violation. And then secondly, we wanted to argue about the religious test for office. Um, we believe that that um, principle in our Constitution also extends to citizenship. Um, it's, it's necessary. You can't hold office unless you're a citizen. So um, it, it necessarily extends to that. But we would believe that it, it goes even further. Um, what the Constitution, Article 6, says is there should shall be no religious test for office or public trust. trust. Yes, and right. we believe that public trust extends to not only citizens, but also visitors? people who are applying for citizenship, um, visitors um, to our country. Um, and so we really want to um, ensure that our government um, does not create political privilege for religion in this country. I think it's important too for people to know, you know, if you're an atheist out there and you're thinking, well, I don't understand how this is under FFR's purview, it's not just the favoring of Christianity, but being able to disfavor that religious minority, who's the next group that's going to be disfavored? It's it going to be atheists. <clears throat> and right. Obviously, if you can persecute or discriminate against one religious minority, you can persecute against any other number of them, including the non-religious. And we are tied with Muslims as the most unpopular group by religious the identification. And, and we're also working to bring some of these atheist bloggers in really benighted areas of the world that are under, living under threat of death to this country and to help them escape. And you know that's going to make our job harder if the government can discriminate against them. And exactly. also, I think it should be understood that the Freedom From Religion Foundation works for the Establishment Clause, um, which is there should be no religious test for public office and separation of church and state. But the twin aspect of the First Amendment is the Free Exercise Clause. Usually we're, we're, we're worrying about it being misinterpreted as, as Roy Zimmerman said, but you, I can, uh, I'm I can practice, practice my, my religion, religion and you can practice my religion too. <laughs> but we do believe in true religious liberty. And I believe that in a country where you have separation of church and state, the religion stays out of government, we can live harmoniously regardless of our religion. That's what we're after in this country. We're not after to convert everybody against their will to atheism. Right. We're here to say you can believe whatever you like. We'd like to you know, be able to debate those arguments, but we want true religious liberty. And there is no such thing as the freedom of religion without a government that is free from religion. Exactly. So now could you tell us the update because there's been some news. Sure. So um, there have been a couple um, iterations of the order. Um, he issued a second order in March um, and that order was set to expire. It expired um, at the end of last week. Um, so there's a third executive order um, that he issued at the beginning of this week um, that added a couple of other countries that are not um, Muslim-majority countries, um, including Venezuela and North Korea. Um, and because of this, um, the Supreme Court has asked for additional briefing. Um, they want to know whether now that there is a, a new version of the order, whether the case is moot. Um, so they removed the oral arguments, which were sent for October 10th off of the Supreme Court calendar, um, and asked for additional briefing from the parties. Um, so it, it's not that they're not hearing it. Um, we just don't know if they're going to hear it um, this term. We'll see. Also, could you talk to this rather phony edition of these countries? Yeah, I mean, they really um, are just added, I think, to save the executive order. Yeah. Um, you it's know, the goal is to make it harder to challenge. Right, it's pretty, right. Pretty, pretty transparent. <laughs> this seems to be like a McCreary situation, which was the Ten Commandments um, situation in Kentucky, where they put up the Ten Commandments by themselves. Um, realized during the course of litigation that they were going to lose, and so then they added all of these secular documents. It's really the same situation here. They realized that they were going to lose, um, so now they're adding some other countries that, um, you know, are seemingly um, not based on religion, um, you know, because we get, what, 10 people from North Korea per year? Um, or, or less, I can't right. remember. <laughs> right. And, and then Venezuela's got some political unrest. But. Right, right. But I think, um, you know... Also, Chad was added. Yes. And Chad is an ally in Africa, and now they're terribly offended. <laughs> right. So... 
And I think the um, the arguments will be that it's not moot. This is really just um, trying to save something that had a, a religious um, and discriminatory purpose in the first place. Um, so I think um, that's what the respondents will argue. And, um, and if draw, drawing on McCreary is a, actually a great point. There's my favorite. One of my favorite lines is. The court says the world is not made brand new every morning. Exactly. And they're basically saying you can't escape the history that you have here. We know what you're trying to do. So hopefully we'll get something similar. Right, right. And that will be highlighted in briefs um, <laughs> from many, many people. It was also in our original brief. So if we have the opportunity to submit another brief based on this third executive order, I think we'll do that as well. So Mason asks, how long does it take to get back to me when I send in a legal complaint? Well, we strive to get back to people within um, a week. Um, that's not always possible based on the volume of complaints that we're receiving, um, but we do a pretty good job of getting back to people within a week or two. And don't uh, they get an automatic right, acknowledgement? When, right. When you submit the form online, you get an automatic acknowledgement. Um, but then our intake attorney, Matt A. Ziegler, um, tries to get back um, more personally to you within a week. Um, oftentimes we do need more information. Um, that seems and to so be the hang that up. is what our uh, response is saying, well, this is great, but we need to know XYZ before we can proceed. Um, so, but we are pretty quick, I think, with our turnaround times. And that's one thing that people can do to make it more likely, we'll get to it more quickly, is to provide as much information. Our web form is pretty specific. We need to know these things. And the more detail people can give us, the more likely we are to be able to act on it right away. And I would also just add that we have um, FAQs up on our website that yes. address a lot of these issues that people write to us about. Um, so if you have a chance to see if um, there's an FAQ on your particular issue and review that and make Before. sure Right, before right. you submit it, um, you can answer some of the questions that we're likely to, to ask of you um, before we can take action. That's always helpful. Yeah, and Maddie's just going to cut and paste that FAQ anyway in the right. reply. <laughs> and that's in the same drop down under legal at ffref.org. You can find the FAQ and you can find the report of state church violations. There are a lot of great answers in that FAQ. So, Elena F Fleischer uh, praises the separation of state and church, and then she says, My question is, how do we keep the separation of church and state while having politicians trying to teach religion in public schools and make it a part of science. And I would say, well, that's what we're here for. We're here, to, <laughs> we're here to prevent that. Those are violations of the separation of state and church. So you get in touch with FFRF and we'll fix it for you. Right. I mean, I think that's the answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, and, and the law, for the most part, in our public schools is still good, although there are overt attempts to uh, Roll, roll back on 65 years of Supreme Court precedent. Creationism is illegal, uh, prayer, ritual, um, indoctrination. Uh, Public schools is one of this the, is not still allowed. kind of a lockbox. Except for vouchers that yes. get around all of this. Yes. Public money going to religious schools that can then impose creationism and prayer in a religious agenda. So that's the, the one real difficult problem. I also think that it's important for um, atheists and, and free thinkers to get involved um, with their local school boards. And if you have a student in the school district, you can go to these board meetings and see what they're talking about, see what um, changes in the curriculum they're proposing, um, and, and let them know that you're an atheist and that you want science education. Um, I think the more out there and involved you can be, um, you can educate these politicians on the law. Sometimes, you know, they're just spouting off and they don't know what the Supreme Court has said on these matters. That's a great point. Yeah, one voice of reason on a school board can make a huge difference. And Be we, proactive. Yeah, and we actually sent out an action alert to all our New Mexico members because they're looking at toying with the science standards in New Mexico and hopefully be able to push back on that. We're encouraging people to go to their go to the meetings that they're having. So we have another, this is an anonymous question. Uh, I noticed a big reaction to that Alabama football complaint. What is it about football and God that gets people so fired up? Do you get a lot of pushback on those lawsuits? <laughs> well, Andrew, do you want to talk about that one? <laughs> I mean, we do. We, it's odd. You know, it, religion in the public schools seems to come from two sources mostly, coaches and math teachers, which is just Math weird. teachers? I guess I hadn't heard that. Yeah. The, Patrick and I have a, a, some <laughs> theories about this. But, but coaches, and particularly football coaches in the South, is one of the biggest problems that we see. And I think it, there is sort of this sense of, you know, football is so important and 
critical to these schools, they, they believe that they kind of think they can get away with and do anything. And we've seen just all kinds of violations you can imagine. Baptisms on the field at football games, uh, you know, prayer, taking, taking kids to church uh, before games. I mean, you name it, we've seen it. Um, and we actually did a couple years back a big report on the chaplains at the college level uh, called Pray to Play, which you know examined this problem at the college level where it's just as rampant as at the public school level. Um, so I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe it's these coaches think they are God. But <laughs> right, right. Well, I think, I mean, we've had coaches say that this is their chance to proselytize students. You know, they, in the course of their career, they've been able to turn hundreds of students um, to Jesus and things like that. So I do think there are some improper purposes there. Um, but also, some of these school districts know what they're doing is wrong. Having um, prayer over the loudspeaker before the games, they know that's illegal. It's been illegal for a long time. Um, but they're just waiting for someone to call them out on it. Um, I, that superintendent in Alabama said the same thing. Um, you know, yeah, it was wrong. We're just kind of waiting till somebody said something. Um, and that happens all the time. I feel like every fall we get that kind of complaint. Yes. Now, I wonder, while we have a national audience, do you want to make a pitch on the school district that we are waiting for someone to come forward on? Oh, Bell County, Kentucky. Um, Bell County, Kentucky did the right thing back in 2011 um, when I contacted them and told them that um, they could not have prayer over their loudspeaker. Um, they canceled it, and like um, what always happens in these complaints is they stop the violation. Um, there's huge public outcry. Um, the next home game, um, everybody shouts the Lord's Prayer or does some sort of like very loud prayer um, before the game starts. Um, and then it dies down and the next fall everybody kind of forgets about it. Um, unfortunately, Bell County didn't. Um, in 2015, there was a new superintendent who decided to bring back prayer. Um, and we have not been able to challenge um, this school district because um, we're lacking uh, a plaintiff um, in that case. Um, so if you're in Bell County and you go to the football games or you go to the graduations, um, they do the Lord's Prayer at the graduations. Um, and from what I understand, religion is pretty pervasive in that district. Um, all of the doors are decorated with crosses at Easter and nativities at, at Christmas. Um, and you know, it's in their curriculum and things like that. So um, it is a district that we would like to sue. Um, we just need somebody to come and and Who's got brave, the standing. Right. Be brave, stand up against the district with us. And it's, I mean, it's shocking that in this day and age you see such a flagrant disrespect for the First Amendment of the Constitution. They just, they know it's wrong and they don't care. But that's why FFRF is here. And we're not going anywhere. Uh, we will be back, however, next week for FFRF's Ask an Atheist, and I'm not, I'm not sure what we're going to be talking about next week. You'll have to stay uh, tuned. Oh, no, no. We, we, know? we know. We do? Yeah. <laughs> and, and also, uh, we want to let everyone know that if you want to share this program, lots of people are working during this Facebook Live. Yeah. You, what can you do? You can go to the YouTube channel. You can go to the YouTube channel, and you can share this later on on your own Facebook page That's for right. all, your, all your friends to see. Wear that atheism with pride. So I'm Rebecca Markert with Annie Laurie Gaylor and Andrew Seidel for the Freedom from Religion Foundation. So come back next week, noon central, when Annie Laurie is going to tackle the topic of why women need to be free from religion, Ooh, yeah. particularly from the Bible. Very and exciting. so you can send me your questions and your comments by, by video or text via FFRF's Facebook page. Thank Very you exciting. for joining us.